And as we continue our conversation, I'd like to introduce you to a message from our sponsor, Alexion Pharmaceuticals. We'd like to welcome Del LaBelle. He is the head of U.S. Government Affairs and Policy, and Tom DeFay, who heads up the diagnostic strategy and operations for the company. Take it away, Del and Tom. Good afternoon. I'm Del LaBelle, head of U.S. Government Affairs and Policy at Alexion. And while patients we treat live with rare diseases, we know that this journey to treatment is long and arduous. I can unfortunately speak firsthand from dealing with a loved one as a caregiver, taking many, many years and many, many specialists to finally receive a diagnosis. And on average, it takes 4.8 years and 7.3 specialists for a patient to receive an accurate uh, diagnosis. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Tom DeFay, who helps lead Alexion's efforts in ensuring we reach patients earlier in the diagnostic journey. And today we will discuss how to promote speedier diagnoses through methods like genetic testing and how partnerships and public policy can help move the needle forward. Tom, would you mind introducing yourself? Thanks, Del. It's great to be joining you today. I joined Alexion six years ago with the goal of shortening the diagnostic odyssey for patients with rare disease. In that time, we've been working to accelerate the diagno diagnosis of patients, including contributing to two world records for fastest genetic diagnoses in collaboration with the Rady Children's Institute for Genetics, Genomics Medicine. That's unbelievable uh, when I hear world record. Um, before we dive into all the possibilities that exist to speeding accurate diagnoses. Can you explain what makes rare diseases particularly so difficult to diagnose? When we think of common illnesses like asthma or hypercholesterolemia, rare diseases are far different. And I would like to hear your perspective on that. Absolutely. First off, there are over 7,000 rare diseases. These diseases are by definition rare, so many of them are found once in 100,000 people or even less often. In many cases, the treating physician will never have seen a patient with that particular disorder. Making it more challenging, their symptoms can resemble those of a number of more common diseases. Practically speaking, if you're living in a region with only a few specialists, the expertise to diagnose your condition just not, might not be readily available. However, there is good news. Our understanding of the, gen the genetics of rare disease has never been greater. And since the cost of sequencing patients continues to fall, more and more patients are getting their genome sequenced. For many diseases, including those that are not genetically driven, we're developing techniques to flag patients that may be at risk. It's unbelievable to see um, where we've been, where we're going and, and where we, we could go. It's, it's really exciting, exciting to hear. I want to dig a little deeper into some of the methods that you just mentioned. But first, uh, wondering if you could talk about how rare disease developers play a role in rare disease diagnosis. So we believe that companies that develop rare disease medicines have a shared responsibility to ensure that patients can access their treatments. Now, access is inhibited when a patient can't get a diagnosis or when that diagnosis is inaccurate. As an example of what we can do, we've been working with a company called Genomenon to apply its AI-powered genomic language processing to the published literature, in this case, millions of articles, to identify and curate the genetic variations that have been linked to diseases that Alexion has treatment for. We estimate that this work will have the potential to contribute to diagnosis with genetics about 50% more often. That's a big deal for patients looking for answers, and we've made all that information publicly available through Genomenon's mastermind solution. Just as a quick reminder, diagnosing a rare disease is a multifaceted effort and our genetic understanding of disease is still growing. If a patient doesn't have a known variant, you can't rule that, di that disease diagnosis out. That's really interesting. Let's um, talk about newborn screening. Newborn screening for, for rare diseases is often critical in identifying newborn's illnesses early on, even if the newborn does not yet require treatment. And in the United States, Prevalence, coverage, reimbursement of newborn screening tests vary from state to state. There's a federally recommended list of conditions to screen for, but only certain states have adopted the list into their screening panels. Is consistent treatment of newborn screening important? So as you know, newborn screening helps identify many life-threatening diseases at birth. 
And all babies in the U.S. receive a newborn, newborn screening. But like you said, each state mandates different diseases to screen for. Since diseases that are found earlier can often be treated earlier, which can prevent more serious health problems, consistent treatment of newborn screening is indeed important. Building on that, we are exploring a further collaboration with RADI, potentially including other companies, to try to expand newborn screening by whole genome sequencing to every child in the US, helping to diagnose hundreds of treatable diseases. Our prior collaboration demonstrated that this approach has the sensitivity and specificity to be successful and impact thousands of lives. It's amazing, unbelievable. Um, getting back to some of the methods and tools that you mentioned earlier, there are, are currently several bills being considered at the federal level, some of which also have state components that essentially aim to increase access to things like genetic testing and counseling. As an example, one bill, it's a long one, uh, called the Precision Medicine Answers for Kids Today Act, would um, promote basic access to genomic uh, and genetic testing. The bill um, it's also included in Cures 2.0, and it would create a program at the Department of Health and Human Services for states to provide coverage of genetic and genomic testing for three years. And it would study how this coverage essentially improves the diagnosis of pediatric health conditions. And then uh, another bill, Ending the Diagnostic Odyssey Act of 2021, also promotes whole genomic sequencing for children by allowing state Medicaid programs to cover it for undiagnosis, undiagnosed children uh, up to 21. Can you speak to the importance of access to these types of testings, uh, particularly uh, for the younger populations? Absolutely. Young children who are born with a rare disease face a diagnostic odyssey that typically requires years of testing and immense resources. These act as barriers to treatment and often lead to tragic results. So a state-based program focused on diagnosing diseases much earlier will certainly benefit patients. There is already clear evidence that early diagnosis and treatment of patients can improve lives. And there are hundreds of effective treatments for rare diseases that are available. And through our work helping to diagnose these patients in the neonatal intensive care unit or NICU, patients have been treated earlier than ever before. These patients avoid years of costly and painful testing. And our goal is to have as many of these patients as possible live happy and normal lives. Well, that's good perspective. Really appreciate that, Tom. Uh, you know, finally, there, there is a piece of legislation that would increase access to genetic counselors. And currently, genetic counselors are professionals who essentially provide specialized services in medical genetics and counseling. But they don't have Medicare provider status, um, despite genetic counseling existing as a, a covered benefit. And this is, this is an important um, uh, component here, especially when you look at some of the reimbursement mechanisms. Um, these counselors are, are generally licensed in the state, but the access to Genetic Counselor Services Act of 2021 would require expanded coverage of services furnished by genetic counselors under Medicare Part B through licensing certified genetic counselors as qualified Medicare providers. Can you speak to how genetic counselors are critical for patients to access testing and ultimately a rare disease diagnosis? Yes, this seemingly technical change would make a huge difference for patients with undiagnosed diseases. Genetic counselors help patients access appropriate testing services and identify genetic risk factors. They help patients and HCPs increase awareness of how genetics may play a role. Remember, our knowledge of genetics has leapt forward in recent years, and genetic counselors are critical for interpreting and evaluating the evidence that we can now generate, which helps to achieve the diagnosis. But this is an important part. Access is more than just access to the diagnosis. It's also about access to the knowledge that helps patients make informed decisions about their care. Genetic counselors play an essential role in empowering patients by making genetic results more understandable and helping them decide what to do for their own individual situation. So important. Thanks, Tom. I uh, really appreciate your perspective. And on behalf of Alexion, I would like to uh, thank you for letting us share uh, our perspective with you today on really such an important topic. And it is our hope that this dialogue continues 
uh, that this dialogue will essentially inform policy recommendations to increase earlier and accurate diagnoses for the 30 million Americans living with rare disease. And as an Alexion, uh, US government affairs and policy organization and, and, and organization uh, more generally, we, we really aim to work with rare disease, uh, the rare disease community at Broad uh, to further refine public policy recommendations around diagnostic policies this year and beyond. Thank you. And again, our thanks to Del LaBelle and Tom DeFay, both with Alexion Pharmaceuticals, our sponsor for today's program.